Welcome to 2016, everybody. You ready to worship the Lord with me this morning? Father God, we're going to worship you in this new year. Father God, we're going to usher in a new season in praise and adoration to you, Lord. We're going to celebrate the King this morning, Lord, and declare that this is your year.
Just worship Him right now. Just enjoy the presence of the Most High God right now. Does anybody love the presence of the Lord? Just knowing that He's here, knowing that He's near, knowing that He's working on your behalf, knowing that He loves you, that His promise is to prosper you, to bless you, to keep you, to save you, to protect you to change you, to put you in the places where you need to be, to mold you and make you in what you need to become. His promise that he will carry out the word and promise that he's given to you. The presence of the Lord is here. The presence of the Lord is here. Can we worship him this morning? The presence of the almighty God, creator God, who created the earth. 6,000 years ago is right here, right now. Can we just love his presence this morning? So as the word said, let go of your head right now. We're not worried about everything that's happened this past year. We're not worried about what's happened this morning. We're not worried about the bills that can't be paid. We're not worried about the troubles that's looming over us or the atmosphere that seems to be dark cloud around us. Right now, we're letting all of that go. And right now, we're just bowing before the mighty presence of the almighty God who is here right now saying, what do you need? I love you. You're awesome. You're a blessing. You're of great value to the kingdom of God. Standing over you right now saying, I love you. I did it all for you, and I'd do it all again for you. Just worship him right now. Just worship him right now. Just take a minute and just worship him right now. Not worried about anything else. Nothing else. 
just worshiping God. Right now, God, we just worship you. We praise you, Almighty God. We know for the mighty things that you've done in our lives, that you're continuing to do, that you're going to do for us in our future, blessing us, prospering us, loving us, loving us, loving us, forgiving us, forgiving us, forgiving us over and over and over again. You forgive us, you love us, you forgive us, you love us, you forgive us, you love us, you forgive us, you love us. We mess up and you forgive us and you love us and you forgive us and you love us. I, I messed up this morning, but you forgave me and you still love me. So can we just take a few minutes and worship him the God who has no memory of what you've asked him to forgive. Loves you in spite of yourself. Can we just worship him just a little bit longer? Just love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We worship you. We praise you. We give you all the glory this morning, Lord. Father, we start this first Sunday off in the new year with worship to you. We give you our highest praise right now, our highest worship, our highest love right now, oh God. Father, let us start this year off right, worshiping you, praising you, loving you. Holy Spirit, begin to stir inside of us. Move inside of us right now. Let us not be complacent. Let us not sit still right now, Father. Move us right now. Shake us right now. Stir us right now. Let us not be able to be silent in your presence. Let us not be able to be still in your mighty presence this morning. Let us have a great revelation of who you are and what you've done for us. Worship you, God. We worship you, God. We worship you, God. Hallelujah. 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 As you can tell, I'm excited about God. I am so excited. I read on a Facebook post that said that if you didn't know Jesus, would there be any difference in your daily behavior? If you didn't know him. So right now, the way you're serving Jesus right now, and then if you weren't a Christian, would you act any different other than coming to church? Would anybody out there see anything different? I am excited about God. Amen. I'm excited about his mighty signs and miracles and wonders. I'm excited about his love. Amen. I'm excited about his forgiveness. I'm excited about his peace. I'm excited about this new year and what will come as a result of loving God. I want to show people that I love him. I want to show people that he's the only one. Is there anybody with me this morning? Is there anybody Amen. whose God has changed their life? Hallelujah. Just give him yes. one more hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. You may be seated. Happy New Year, everyone. Woohoo! Welcome to Epic Church. I'm Pastor Michael, one of the uh, executive pastors here. And on behalf of Pastor Steve and Dr. Shirley Arnold, I want to welcome you here today. I would like to invite your attention to our screens for some church announcements. Mark your calendar for Growth Track 2.0, January the 10th at 9 o'clock. Calling all warriors, come on out and join us for prayer every Tuesday night starting at 6.30 p.m. The Bible says that men are always to pray and not faint. See you there. Put my gross. It's me. Rebecca, what are you doing in my house? No, I came to check on you. What's going on? What I'm putting my groceries away for the Daniel Fast. Mm -hmm. The Daniel Fast? Yes. No, sir. No, sir. Popcorn, no I, bishop. What, what is this, what, pizza? Yes. This is not Daniel Fast friendly. What, no, what are you no. talking about? This going to have to go. Are you kidding me? I'm not too obvious. Look, this is Daniel Fast friendly. Grapes. You got pineapples. Okay. All right. Tell bell me. Bell peppers. Mm -hmm. This is the Daniel Fast friendly food. Okay. Yeah. So I need to go back to the store 
So when does this Daniel fast start? It starts January the 11th. January the 11th. January the 11th. Okay, so I need all this stuff, mm -hmm. and it starts on January the 11th. That is right. So that means you have a chance to go to the store and pick up your <laughs> Daniel fast food. Where can I get the manual from? You can go to the lobby. The manual will be out there at the Welcome Center. You can talk to someone out there, and they will help you. Good morning, Epic Church. Uh, we can do that again. Good morning, Epic Church. Good morning. Isn't it good to be in the house of the Lord? Amen, amen. You know, I just got back from Atlanta, and I, I have to give you the highlight of my visit there with the family was we, were, we, we, we purchased a tree, and it was already snowed. It was already covered with, like, what looks like snow and had lights in it. You know, that's my kind of tree. I don't know why I didn't find that when I was younger, but now that I'm old, I look for those kinds of things. So we're pulling the tree into the house. And my granddaughter, two years old, she saw it. She said, Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> and I thought, boy, what happened to the simplicity of being thankful? Yeah. Just being thankful. She didn't need any gifts under that tree. She all she knew was that the festivities had begun. Yeah. I want you to know, as God's children, yeah. God wants us to be that thankful. You know, in, in Israel, uh, and you can find it in Deuteronomy, they they would bring, because when they went into the promised land, see, we're in the promised land, whether you know it or not, the promise of God to save us from, yeah, we're in the promised land. So when they came to the promised land, what they would do is they would bring a basket that was filled with first fruits and tithes, and they would bring them in and, and see, what we do is we've come, we've got like, we're kind of traditional, we bring it in, drop it in the basket, we don't really know what's going to happen, we don't know why we did it, we just dropped it in there and know that it's a portion of the money that I earned, and there it goes. But for them, it was not, it was not tradition, it was worship. So when they brought the basket in, they, they would talk about how, how we were just a few people about to perish in a famine. And God gave us a land to go into. We went into Egypt, and there he made us mighty and strong and invincible. And then, then the time came when the Egyptians didn't like the way God was making us, so they began to persecute us. And so God, in his mighty hand, delivered us from the hand of the wicked one, the one that was trying to destroy us. And so they always reminded themselves of the salvation of God. They always reminded themselves of the, of the move of God in their life. And I don't know when it was for you, when he saved you, but 41 years ago, he, he delivered my soul. He delivered me from, from damnation. He delivered my soul from condemnation. He delivered my soul from greed and, and anger and selfishness. He delivered me. So, so I, when they brought that offering in, it was a celebration. It was a, it was a confession that I belong to God and he belongs to me. I like that. I'm tired of tradition that says, well, you know, the world says this. It's just a tradition. It's outdated, antiquated. Uh, all that the, that the Christians do, it ain't necessary. You can send your, you can go online, send it in. Just, you know, just go ahead and pass, you know, don't be there. That's something just throw, to have somebody else put it in the basket for you. But for us, it's worship. We come together to give our tithes and our it's worship. We, we, we make a big deal of it because we know that for the most part, you might think it's outdated and antiquated, but God says, my word is timeless. It goes through the generations and it moves like I told it to move. So when we come today, this morning, we give our tithes and our offering. What we do is we take our tithe. And as you get your tithes ready, prepare your tithe. We bring them first before the altar of God and we're thanking God for his salvation and his deliverance and what he's about to do and what he's done already. We just, we're so grateful that we're like my granddaughter. Merry Christmas, everybody. <laughs> That's just the way it, it works. And so as we bring our tithe this morning, then we will take up our offering next. But, it, but, but as we bring it, understand this, that God's word is timeless. And then understand this, that it's not a tradition with us. See, to others, he may be, re he's rejected, but to us, he's precious. All right? And so when we do what we do, we don't do it to prove God right, that he's right about tithing. We do it because he's proven himself to be right about giving the way he says to give. Do you understand that that word invincible means too powerful to defeat and overcome? So when we walk in God's word, we become like him, too powerful to be overcome, too powerful to be defeated. Doesn't matter what I go through. Doesn't matter if I go bankrupt tomorrow. I'm too strong for the enemy of my soul because my life belongs to God. So this morning, I want you to get ready. Get your tithes ready. 
and, get, and, and I mean, think about your tithe this morning. Why did God want He said, I want meat in my house. Thought about the fatherless. He thought about the widow. He thought about those that don't have. And he thought about the priests that, that don't work. So they get their income from the people of God. So as you bring your tithes this morning, think about how holy it is before God, how righteous it is. And then you know what God said? He said, those people are special. You know that's what makes you special? Not because you're sitting up here at Epic Church and it's a good church to go to. That's right. But you're special because God said, you're a, you're a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who brought you out of darkness. So stand with me this morning and bring your tithe into the house of the Lord and rejoice. something God you can't beat God giving and if you could it wouldn't make sense anyway because he's bigger than that but bring your offering this morning with joy can we do that it's the first of the year happy new year's everybody come on down salvation, our deliverance, our healer. You're everything to us, Lord. And we don't bring this as tradition, Lord. We bring it as worship unto you. So we ask that you would bless this offering, bless your people. That's what it's all about anyways. And keep us by your spirit. And we'll be careful to give you praise. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. This is awesome. All of the doors are open. You believe that? Because the word of God is very clear to us that he has opened the doors that no man can close. But he has also closed the doors. That's awesome. And when we really understand that, it changes the way we approach God and the way we approach our lives. Because we do understand that our steps are ordered of the Lord. Well, the steps of a righteous man are ordered of the Lord. And when we really believe that, then we do care. We, we show some care or caution about the way we walk. Right. We want to make sure we walk in the ordered steps. <coughs> Excuse me. So I have a quick story, obviously. Happy New Year, everybody. And it's so good. <coughs> Pastor Steve and I have been gone a, a few weeks, and we're so glad to be back with you always. And I was looking at our, our epic uh, sign here and, and the, the, the gift, and I know that that's like a, was a Christmas-type decoration. But I was sitting there, and I thought, you know what? It's, what it's saying to me is that epic is a gift, right? Yeah. Epic is a gift. <clears throat> yes, amen. <coughs> Not sure how long it may stay up there now because we might need to think about that a while. But 
I want to I want to talk to you this morning and, and first of all I want to tell you a little bit of the saga the ongoing saga and you know I, I kind of include you in everything that happens in our lives and and that's been the way it's been all these years but you know about a year and a half ago I had a, a an event uh, that had to do with my LAD the the one they call the Widowmaker artery and um, mine was 99% blocked yeah no it's terrible isn't it and uh, I was in the Atlanta airport and it was an emergency and all that stuff and and they had to put a stent in that artery now I'm laying there in that bed and I'm thinking lots of things I'm thinking first of all where did this come from how could this have happened to me and and I'm sure none of you would have question those things but I did I really did think about first of all that I could have died and I only had you know th this is what I thought to myself what if I I was really what if I died and and I thought over my last 24 hours and I thought would that be the way I would have wanted to live my last 24 hours and uh, I would like to tell you that I was that I thought I, it was awesome. I didn't. I, there were things I wouldn't have wanted to have done in those last 24 hours that I did and that I was involved with. I thought that isn't the way I want to live my life. It made me start thinking about that and reordering some things because when you come close to death like that, it has an impact on you. Uh, you remember I preached a message not too long, uh, about a year ago now, and I told you about I was going to get a tattoo that said no guarantees. <laughs> but y'all know I'm a chicken about that, so I was... I thought about a stencil, you know, <laughs> but, but we have to live our lives knowing that, that faith does not mean it's a guarantee of every event or detail that we want. The guarantee that we have in faith is that our God is with us in all things, that his word is true, right? And so those are the guarantees, but the guarantees of your next breath are really not there. I'd like to believe they were, you know, I could, I could deceive myself with, with these false kind of um, ideas about life. And, and sometimes people of faith get, they, they live by fantasy and not by faith. Um, they, they think if they just uh, ignore everything else and just go ahead and say by faith uh, that whatever it is they're saying, that means faith. It doesn't. It's not. The, the truth about faith is that we can live in a reality, and I have to take this off, it goes hot and cold in this place. Never lukewarm. Y'all didn't get that. Anyway. <clears throat> that was a sermon. <clears throat> That's right. And we have that hot today. So anyway. <clears throat> Along the way, you, you have to fight. When, when you have something that happens like that, you have to fight the, the thoughts that come in your mind. And I had lots of those kinds of thoughts of death and survival and if it happened one time, it'll happen again. You know, all those ideas. Y'all know what I'm talking about? How when you, through life, that, that conversation that goes on on the inside now, you know that God, and, and as a church, those of you who have been a part of this body, know that God has called us to the nations, and we do a lot of travel, and I think at last, at last count, Pastor Steve and I have been in 41 nations. So we, th throughout our lives with the Lord, we've traveled to a lot of countries, done a lot of work uh, in missions and that sort of thing. And and, and God is, it, that's not over, you know. God is still sending us and there's still places that we are going and going back to and that sort of thing. But, you know, when you go through something like this, not only do, is it, it, does it impact you as an individual, it impacts the people around you. Does that make sense? Yes. So as I was, we were preparing for this last trip in November, uh, to Africa, that's our third time to Africa, to Togo, and we were preparing for that trip, I had uh, the people who loved me around me really didn't want me to go and were very concerned health-wise, should I go, am I strong enough to go after what, you know, I've been through and my health is rebuilding and, you know, do you go? 
not only that, some, some folks that, I, uh, not only my family that I respect, but some other folks that I really respect in the medical field who said to me, you shouldn't go to Africa. Now, here's the problem. I'm faced with what I believe God has told me to do. And now what I hear those who love me saying around me. That's hard because I know that they care about me and, and I know that they want the best for me and all of that. So I had to make a decision. The decision was we're going to go. I'm going because, you know, I believe God has said to go. That's the only thing I know to do is go. However, in the back of my mind, I was continually thinking about the fact that these significant people in my life said don't go. So we went to Africa. It was wonderful. Had I mean, phenomenally life-changing, and we, we, God used us greatly and used me greatly. However, during the time I was there, as I was preaching, and, and I started having these symptoms again in my chest and shoulder. Well, I didn't want to go to a hospital in Togo, and if you haven't ever been to Togo, just let me tell you, you don't want to go to a hospital in Togo. And, and so all I could think of was get on that airplane to get home, got on the airplane, still having symptoms that were really scary kind of symptoms. By the time we got to New York, um, actually, uh, the, uh, the, the ambulance came to the plane and picked me up and took me to the hospital for them to assess me and so forth. They put me in the hospital. They started doing all of the testing and... And, uh, and, they, and I did a stress test, and, and it showed an abnormality around the place where that stent was. And so they were very concerned, transferred me to another hospital. Now I'm going to have to have a heart cath. Now, if you don't know about any of this, I don't mean to scare you, but I'm just telling you. It's not, you know, a day at the park. And, and so all of this is going on. I'm thinking in my mind, I shouldn't have gone. I shouldn't have done it. You know, God, my, my family, people tried to warn me. Why did I do that? I should have just stayed home. I should, I, I thought all those things. They took me for the heart cath. I had to wait like eight hours down in a holding thing for the heart cath. So eight hours to lay there and think about what was about to happen, what they were going to find and what would they have to fix and what would have, you know, open heart surgery is that, I mean, you know, all those things are on the table. And so I, I'm laying there and thinking about all those things. And in my mind, I'm thinking, you know, I, I'm going to have to, I guess um, it's over. So I'm laying there on the table. And I meant by over, by the traveling and the schedule and all those things that I've carried for 40 years. And um, the doctor comes in, does this heart cath. He walks back out and he says, well, everything is perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong in there. I mean, in fact, that stent is working beautifully. And we checked all the other arteries. You're clear. It's great. So I'm laying there on that where you have to lay to do all of this. He says that to me. And I said, well, why all the symptoms? And so he threw some suggestion out there. But in that moment, I realized something. And I realized that the enemy comes at us in very subtle ways. And the purpose of the enemy's attempt is to paralyze us or stop us or abort what God has for us and God has for us to do. And, and as I'm laying there, I realize I just came dangerously close to coming into agreement with fear about my life. And see, that's hard because you, most people looking at it would say, well, wait a minute, that's just being cautious. But here's the problem. And I know it was fearless in 15, but I told you it'll have to be fearless in 16, 17, 18, and 19. I mean, fearless is forever in our lives, right? But I realized that being cautious is one thing, wise, it's being, there's a difference between wisdom and, and fearfully living because of what might happen. And I laid there and I thought this to myself then, I thought I have come dangerously close to coming into full agreement with what the enemy was setting up for me. 
instead of recognizing the fact that when God speaks, I follow God. And it comes to this, ladies and gentlemen, and, and understand, hear my heart when I say this, but I have to follow God. So if I die on the mission field, y'all rejoice. Because I, we can't be afraid of death. Being afraid of death will keep you all your life. And, and when I was born again, I was so afraid of everything and afraid of dying. There's a scripture that really is my life scripture where, where in, in, in the New Testament where it says that when you were born again, that you are delivered from that fear of death that, is a, that plagues you all your life. Well, we can't be afraid of death ever. Faith can never be based in fear. I can have faith about my future, but not if I'm afraid of what the future may bring. Yeah, right. Amen? Yeah. I need you to stay with me this morning because, you know, this is the first Sunday in January. I'm delivering a first of the year message, okay? And <laughs> I want you to hear what I'm trying to uh, express this morning, which is as we go forward, there is a requirement on us. And if you want a prophetic word for this year, it is this. It really is courage to believe. It really is to take the word of God, believe the word of God, believe God's word to you specifically as well as God's word to all of us and to walk fearlessly and with courage to obey the Lord. Obedience is better than sacrifice. And I cannot stay in agreement with any plan of the enemy that will stop me from doing what God has called me to do or God has called me to be. Amen? Amen. Fear of what people think, fear of the future, fear of what it looks like or what I look like or any of those things can cannot gain preeminence in our lives because if it does, the enemy has won and you can be in church every Sunday, you can even serve on the dream team and still abort the purpose of God for your life because you're living in that place of agreement with the enemy's forecast for your life instead of God's plan. Amen? So I want to read to you a scripture. You know, it always starts in the garden. And I want, to, I want to read to you out of Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any animal of the field which Yahweh God had made. He said to the woman, yes, has God said you shall not eat of the, any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, of the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it lest you die. The serpent said to the woman, you won't surely die, for God knows that in the day you eat it, your eyes will be open. God knows who you are. He understands that you're weak. He understands that you have desires and that you're really working on things. He understands all of that. You're not going to die because you do it, because God will forgive you after all. Isn't that what grace is? Your eyes will be opened and you will be as God, knowing good and evil. Now, it starts off uh, not by saying, now the serpent was more evil than any animal of the field. It says the serpent was more subtle or cunning. <clears throat> we have identified the way the enemy works immediately in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. That the enemy works in our lives in a subtle way. Generally, it is not in an in-your-face way because we would recognize it that way. He generally comes subtly. He comes craftily is what that means. He has crafty schemes. He's got schemes. He's got plans on how to get you in agreement with him that comes against God. It's amazing how this kind of subtlety or being so subtle, how... Here, you would think, wouldn't you think that even Adam and Eve would understand this? I mean, God said it. It was really plain. He didn't, he didn't say it in a weird, uh, you know, unrecognizable way. God said to them, you can eat everything you want here. He said, there's one tree. Again, he, God wasn't trying to trick them or make it difficult. God just told them, don't do that. 
That's the only thing. But he didn't say just don't do it, don't touch it. Because God was laying out for us and helping us to understand the strategy it, it takes for us to live this life in victory. And he said, not only don't look at it, but do not touch it. Don't let it get to that point. Because if you just look at it, and it, then if you move on and touch it, then probably you will not overcome it. It will overcome you. So don't touch it. That's what he said. But, but he said, uh, because then you'll die. Now, the word die there is not just the word death, although the, it, it does mean to die. But it literally means to die prematurely. So he said, here's the deal. Don't, don't do this. Do not eat of that tree. You know, don't touch it. Don't have anything. Don't do anything with this. Because it, if, you, if you look at it, if you start lusting after it, if you start considering it, if you start sharing in the possibility of this, and then you move to touching it, then you're on your way to premature death, being prematurely deactivated. Wow. Wow. God told them what to do, but they didn't, they didn't listen, and we know what happened. And as a result of what happened there, we have borne the, the, that sin problem then from that moment until this. The reason we must be born again is because we are born into sin because of what happened in that choice. When it would have been so simple, don't look at it. Just don't even, don't handle it. Don't have anything to do with it. When you know this is something that you shouldn't do, you will die prematurely, which is what happened. And now we face that in our lives every day. But it is by the blood of the Lamb, the word of our testimony, and not loving our lives unto death that allows us to be overcomers every day. And so we can overcome. God gave us a solution to the problem. However, the problem came because... People just didn't listen to what God said and did what God said, but listen to the, subtil, the, the, subtle, uh, the subtle attraction that came their way. Y'all are so quiet. Did y'all, I, I guess I could have preached and made you shout. You'd liked it better on the first Sunday. <clears throat> so how does the enemy work on it? Well, it's clear. Get you in agreement with this subtle idea get you to look on it and consider it and then get you to interact with it and then get you to fall for it. And so many times we find ourselves, see, sin is easy. I mean, if I'm talking about adultery, you're, you're thinking, oh, well, yes, that makes sense. I can talk, I can see the whole process of adultery and how bad that is and how you move into that in sin and, and how you shouldn't, even if you were to lust after a woman or lust after a man that you need to, you know, not look. And so we can think of all the ways that we deal with that. But here's our reality. Most of us aren't dealing with that temptation every day. Some of us probably are. But most of us aren't. We're not dealing with the biggies, the big sins that seem to be so easy to recognize. But what we are dealing with are the things in our lives that are causing us to be prematurely deactivated in God. And we find ourselves stuck in some place, no matter what it is, and even a good place, even something that seems good. Don't let your good replace God. And that's the problem with us is that if it's good, it's subtle. You know, my family, I love my family with everything that's in me. It was hard for me to go to Africa because I, I, I love my family. And if they care about me, I want to do what it, it will bless them or help them. Does that make sense? All of us face those moments. I told you that whole story for that reason. We all face those issues of what God is saying to us and how we live this life as believers. Come on, guys. This, here's the real truth. It, 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 you're, there really, really isn't a gray place in God. It's just not gray. You can't walk the gray line. You're either, you know, on the Lord's side or you're not on the Lord's side. That's really what it comes to. And too many times we try to live our lives just placating all the things in our lives and the people in our lives and the way we think and the things we want, the things we lust after. Whether that be position, money, I don't know. Or that elusive thing we call happiness. We're trying to get, be happy. And so then when we're not happy, 
we will do whatever it is we think makes us happy, which may be the opposite of what God wants us to do, but we're so busy on our search to be happy, we don't know the difference. And the enemy uses subtle things to get us off course. And, and this year, I believe more than ever, it, it, the line is clear and it is important for us and, and if I could say it this way, rather than this year, this season that we are in, that we are careful about this. If we're not, we'll find ourselves slipping over into the, the subtle things and prematurely get deactivated. Some of us have wondered why. Why can't we overcome? Why can't we get through this? Why can't, because sometimes it's going to take a, an outright no to something that we have to say no to that we would like to do, that we'd like to have, that we'd like. We're not used to that. We're used to making a way where there seems to be no way. <laughs> and if God says no, then we figure a way to get it nicely. And so we think we're not sinning or whatever it is. I don't know. When we talk about fasting, and I, I, I mean, honestly, all of us look at we look forward to it in one respect because we, we know the results of it. But how many of us really want to give up? <laughs> and, and remember, when you're fasting, it's denial. It's not delay. So you don't, you know, get a big chocolate cake and put it in the freezer. So as soon as the clock strikes midnight... You eat that big old piece. You didn't, you didn't fast. You just delayed eating. I'm sorry. It's subtle. It's a subtle thing that the enemy does. And we must ask the Holy Spirit to show us in every way in our lives. Now, you know, I, 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 I've got another hour to preach. So I'm just going to do this uh, without all these scriptures. But um, the example that I thought of is, is uh, Samson. You know, Samson was the promise of God to a man and woman who were barren. Could not have children. And God said, I'm going to give you a son, but here's the thing. To the, to the mother, you cannot have wine. You can't drink anything comes out off the vine. And because this baby is consecrated from the womb. And what you do will impact what you carry. So I'll say it again. If you, there's something holy and consecrated on the inside of you. And if you interact with anything else that you should not, it will impact the purpose and the thing that you carry. So she, this is what the angel told her, you, you, have, to, you have to live the Nazarite vow, which is this baby was set apart as a Nazarite, which means that they were consecrated from the womb and that they never drank and they didn't ever cut their hair. And so they, they told, so the angel told the mother, you've got to, you've got to care for this, not just as your baby. This isn't just your son. This is a consecrated purpose of God that is on the inside of you and is going to grow on the inside of you until delivery comes and you're responsible to make sure that the atmosphere over this holy thing on the inside of you is handled correctly. And, and so she did. But here's the problem. When Samson, you know, as he was growing up, well, his mom and dad, he was the apple of their eye. After all, he was the gift of God to them. And, and I mean, you would think the angels showed up. You would think they would be smart enough with what God had given them. But, but you know, he, he, want, he found a woman he wanted. And she wasn't the right woman. And the Bible says that the father knew she wasn't the right woman. But he went down to the camp. And, and created a big feast for him the way they did. That was their custom. So even though the father knew that this wasn't the right thing, he's looking in the face of his son whom he loves, who's saying, Daddy, this woman is it for me. Oh, I'm in love. She's beautiful. Oh, and, and here's a daddy who has been with an angel 
and looks at his son, knows it's not right, but how could it really be wrong if loving you is wrong? And so he goes down. He, it's a very subtle maneuver that moves him. And, and so he, he, marry, he, he, he marries this woman, and then nothing goes right with this woman. And, and so history is going to repeat itself because there's this other woman named Delilah. And after, after already having moved into agreement, you see what's happening is they're moving out of agreement with the will and purpose of God. Now subtly they are moving until when he wants Delilah, who is a daughter of his enemies, well, now dad can't really say anything, do anything, because they've already compromised the first step and they've handled sin. And now it's happening again, and here is Samson. And uh, we kind of know the story about what happens next there. As, as he is in love with this woman and she says, where is the secret of your strength? Now, so far, he has, he has, he, he's been smart enough not to tell where his strength uh, came from. But understand, once you get on the slippery slope of whatever it is, then it just, these things begin to happen until you suddenly look around and say, how did I get here? What happened? What ha when I was, I, was, I was hot after God and ablaze with love for the things of God and, and loving the house of God and serving in the house of God. And I, what, how did I get here? Well, you didn't get there in one step. You looked, you handled and touched. Before you know it, that thing has now that, whatever that fruit was, it now begins to reproduce itself. And so now we find ourselves more and more separated. And here is, here is Samson. And after three times, I mean, three times he held strong. But you know what? Fourth time was the charm, apparently. And he told her where his strength was. He said, well, here's my strength. It's in my long, beautiful hair. And she cut his hair. We know the story. He went into bondage, and, and he was weak. He couldn't fight off. And this is the guy who had fought lions and tigers and bears. Oh, my. He was a guy, you know. He was a strong guy. But now he couldn't, he couldn't fight off anything, and he was in chains and all of that. All of that came as a result. It was a subtle movement throughout his life. At some point, you have to shake yourself and, and say, what, where am I? Am I where God wants me to be? And what am I believing? And what am I coming to agreement with? And what is it that keeps me from moving out in what God has for me and wants me to be? Not just what I do, but who I am. How did all of that happen? Well, you'll find there's a place where you took a curb. You know, you just, you took a little turn towards something you wanted. Because you won't turn towards something you don't want. Something that came, something you wanted, something you felt like you had the right to or whatever it is. And in that began a turn in your life that may have taken you off course to such a degree that the reality is I don't even know who I am anymore. And I, I, it's time for me to recover and reclaim my identity in Christ and who I am. I'm not going to apologize for who I am any longer. I'm not going to try to make everybody and everything happy about who I am. This is the reality of who I am. I am a, a sinner that is saved by the real kind of grace, not that play grace that uh, everybody's talking about today where, where grace just allows you to do whatever you want to do and it's the grace of God and we can, we can take that grace and we can go ahead and live our lives and, and, and do what we want to do in the grace of God. It is not the way that saving grace comes to your life and when you are born again, you don't get born again by just coming into a, an agreement with God, some kind of contractual arrangement that says, okay, well, I, I'll, I'll now say I'm a Christian. When you get born again, you come into a covenant, not a contract. A covenant that was born and made through the blood of Jesus Christ. And, and that means he gets everything. Not, 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 the, not the parts you want to give him, but he gets it all. Even the parts you don't want to give him, right? Yeah. 
Am I right or wrong here, guys? I, I think that the world is kind of upside down. And I'm talking about the church too. It doesn't understand. This thing is not for sissies. This is not walking with Christ is not a matter of trying to make everybody happy and do it all right and all those. It's, it's <laughs> it is about making a decision that radically changes you and changes your life, and then everything that comes out of you comes through the filter of His blood. Not the filter of my desires. Y'all okay? Paul said, I mean, Peter said this in 2 Peter 1.16. We did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus. But we were eyewitnesses of his majesty the power he talks about. We didn't come and we didn't try to make up little stories that would make you feel better. He said, we came, we made known to you the power, the dunamis, the dynamite power, that, that power that will, will change lives and heal bodies and turn things around and deliver people. We made you known, we made that known to you and, and we were eyewitnesses of the glory or the majesty of God. And that word majesty is where we get the word mega in, in the Greek. He said, we made you, made known to you that it is a mega message. This thing is big. This isn't going to hide in a corner somewhere in a closet. This thing, this gospel, it is a mega revelation. James 1, I'll end with this in verse 19. So then, my beloved brethren, let every man be, everybody say it with me, swift to hear slow to speak and slow to anger for the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God therefore putting away all filthiness and overflowing of wickedness receive with humility the implanted word which is able to save your souls but be doers of the word and not only hearers, deluding or deceiving your own self. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, <laughs> he's like a man beholding his natural face in a mirror. For he sees himself and goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. I don't know, that was pretty good. But he who looks into the perfect law, the law of freedom, and continues, and continues, not being a hearer who forgets, but a doer of the work. This man will be blessed in what he does. If anyone among you thinks himself to be religious while he doesn't bridle his tongue, but deceives his heart, this man's religion is worthless. He's making this very clear to us. If we want to deal with this subtle move of the enemy in our lives, we have to be swift to hear, Slow to speak, slow to anger. We have to be, uh, we, we cannot be. He says, don't, don't be forgetful hearers. Can't do that. If, if we do that, if, if, we, if we're a hearer of the word and we don't do the word, so we've got to be swift to listen. What, what does that mean at the end of the day? This is it. The promises of God are yes and amen. And every one of us sitting in this room have a word or a promise from God in one area or another. Every one of us are believing God for something. And it may be health and it may be family. It may be, it, it may be finance. It, it could be anything, but we're believing God for something. And whatever it is that we're believing God for has given to us a place, a, a, a place for the implanted word to take root. So if I'm believing for my health, which I am, and I'm believing for the full restoration of my health, then I have an implanted word that, that by his stripes I am healed and that uh, the, the, the healer is in my house and that Jesus is the healer and by his blood and all. See, I have those words that, you know, all, all those promises are to me. Well, if that's true, then that implanted word in me has to be just like Samson has to be. I have to create an atmosphere around that implanted word 
Lord so that when the subtlety of the enemy comes my way, it does not get me off track because it sounds good, it sounds right. There's no way that Adam and Eve should have been uh, gotten off course, but the enemy is subtle. He uses part truth. He uses people that we love. He uses things that we love. He uses ambitions that are in us to get us to turn our sight just enough so that we get off course and now the thing, the holy thing, the word of God that's implanted in us cannot come forth into fruition because we're so busy being led astray in every way and we find ourselves subtly off course but off course nonetheless. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know about me. And I love truth even when it hurts. In fact, I kind of like it to hurt because when it does, it helps me to make the change. Because that's what truth does. Truth sets us free. In order to set us free, it's got to change us from whatever bondage we're in. I want the truth, and I, before God, ask him to show me the truth about myself. Where did I get off course? What was the, what's the correction that needed to be made? I needed to make a correction about my health, about traveling and that sort of thing. I had to correct it. I, I talked to all the people around me. I said, I need y'all all to come into agreement with the will of God. Stop, stop caring about whether I'm going to die out of the mission field now. Let's come into agreement with the will of God. I've got to do what God calls me to do, period. You want me to do that? I want you to do that. I have to come out of agreement with all of that forecast of the enemy and come into agreement with God. My life and times are in his hands. Amen? Amen. He knows my end from my beginning. He already knows it, guys. He already knows your life. He already knows. And so I've got a holy thing on the inside of me. And that holy thing is the purpose of God that has been conceived and implanted by the will of God. So I have to make a decision here. Will I be like that mother that creates the atmosphere so that my baby can be born and my baby can live the way it's supposed to? Or am I going to just look at it and say, you know, it's my baby. This is my thing. Uh Uh-uh. Your life is not your own. It's no longer I that lives but Christ that lives in me oh this is a this is a hard thing I say to us this morning and yet it is the truth that will set us free so that we can be everything that God has called us to be and accomplish the reason we were put on this earth you breathe for a reason and that breath is not for you hallelujah stand to your feet I know it makes you think, and everybody's still not quite out of the holiday mode, I understand. But we must be determined. Before we start a fast, we, we need to be determined in our hearts that we are going to follow what God may reveal to us in the fast. This is a time. You know, not everything's instantaneous. Some things take searching. Some things, you know, search me, oh God. I mean, the psalmist was clear about all of this. I mean, it, you, you have to, sometimes you just have to come before God and say, I don't even know how to figure out where I got off course. So here I am. Reveal to me. This is the right and the responsibility of every believer to communicate with God and in that communication to hear God's word to us. So as we enter into this time of fasting, and I know that we're going we're gonna to give everybody some opportunity to do it any way they need to and all of that. We do the Daniel fast because it's kind of easy to, to say. It's very difficult 21 days to go completely without food. I mean, I just have to tell you, all of us, it's hard to do. And we understand we have people who have never fasted, people who have fasted and never want to do it again. <laughs> and then we have those that, that this is something we do every year. It's, a, it's an exercise we do in faith. And, and it's just part of being a believer, you know. You, you read the Bible, you come to church, you pray, you fast, you take communion. All of that's part of what a believer does. And this is a time for us as a, as a church to come together, to say, let's do this together in the presence of God. And uh, you'll have a little uh, 
form, uh, what do you call it, a d devotional book, yeah, so that we all can pray to, together every day by following that. It's a great, great idea, but here's the deal. If all we do is just another exercise, forget it. Like, I want my steak. But if we enter into this thing, first of all, examining ourselves, because to try to examine anything else before examining yourself doesn't even make sense. So let us enter in. As we prepare this week, let's continue to prepare. and Get yourself ready for, for when we do this next Monday together. Let's, let's do this together, examining our own hearts, examining our own motives, and asking the question, am I off course anywhere, Lord? Is there anywhere that I have been prematurely deactivated? And if there is, I want to be activated again. Amen. Father, I come to you today in Jesus' name, thanking you for just your presence in our lives and, and your graciousness towards us. Today, Lord, we are aware that we are but flesh and how easy it is for us to miss the cue that you give us when you tell us to walk this way and uh, we walk our own way. So today, Lord, we ask you to... to to alter our course and bring and, and correct it and get us back on the course that you have set for us and order our steps and let us help us to become so um, just aware, Lord, and, 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 and specifically to understand. And, and Lord, there's many of us in this room right now with questions that we no longer ask because we didn't know the answer or we didn't like the answer we got or we never heard. Lord, resurrect the, those, those questions in us again that we can hear from you in, in specific areas, in our marriages, in our health, in our finances, in, in our call, in every way, Lord. Let us be bold enough to ask the question and courageous enough to say yes to the answer. We love you this morning, Lord, and, and thank you for all that you've done in our lives. And everyone who agreed said, Amen. God bless you this morning. If you're here with us for the first time, we're so glad that you're here. And we'd love for you to, if God says this is a place you need to be a part of, we'd love for you to consider being a part of this body and joining us. We have two services. So this is our early service. I'm really proud of y'all. I thought nobody would be here this morning, um, early and cold. But uh, I, I'm grateful that you came today and that you're a part of what God is doing. And I, I want you to, uh, our pastors and elders are here and would love to pray with you if you need prayer in any way, uh, the prayer of agreement. We want you to feel free to do that. I don't know if you just need to come and say, pray with me right now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my stake in the ground to say, I'm going to hear what God has to say, and I'm going to follow God in every area of my life. If that's you, then they'll be here to pray with you, the prayer of agreement. God bless you this week. He's changed us mightily through his great power. And we can help change somebody else's life because of that. So go out and change somebody's life. God bless you all. And Wednesday night, we're back on Wednesday night service. Amen.